Welcome to Holy Fuck. Holy Fuck. Holy Fuck. Two gals on the prowl for enlightenment, sex, and all things holy. Holy Fuck. Each week, beauty alchemist and transformational coach and speaker, Catherine McClelland, and spiritual healer and life coach, Krista Kim, discuss navigating spiritual consciousness in a real human body. Stumbling through dating, relationships, and everyday life, all while maintaining a fucking sense of humor. Hey, Krista. Hi, Catherine. How are you this morning? I'm good. Welcome to all of our listeners out there. Welcome to Holy Fuck Podcast, or (laughs) the Holy Fuck Podcast, depending on how you type it into your URL. We are here this morning doing a special episode because we could not leave you alone out there without Mm. talking to you about this topical stuff that is big and interesting and sad and scary and exciting and full of growth and so much potential for all of us that we felt like we were going to gather and do something new. So we are on a different day and a different time. And so we're a little maybe off schedule too. (laughs) But it's important. So. It's important. And you're important. And this is an important topic. So we're going to say important no more times in this show. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to start with something that really struck me about this whole period of time in our history and what transpired last week in these hearings in the Senate, what we saw, and what it evoked in our culture. And it's just so exciting. And I I know that people might think Krista and I are crazy to interpret this from a lens of exciting, but it's exciting because the thing that really hit me was, oh, thank God we're growing again. As Mm. a culture, as a people, as human beings, we're growing. We're being pushed up against. We're being forced (laughs) at time, like shoved out the door, like you are going to do this. Yeah, and we're facing big choices. Mm -hmm. We're facing huge choices. How are we going to be with someone who's made herself extremely vulnerable? How are we going to be with a situation where someone else is feeling completely attacked? Do you want to get more specific with the names? Just Sure, I'm just saying it as a general topic right now. Like, how do we, how are we with that? So with Dr. Ford, how are we going to respond to her as, there's so many levels. There's as a woman, as a professional woman, as a woman who deserves to be respected and honored. And we saw all sorts of levels of different ways that people were responding to her in that. And also, as a federal judge, how were we responding to that person? Mm -hmm. What do we expect from someone who we put on the spot and has been put on the spot for two weeks where we have literally... Grilled. Probably kind of tied his hands behind his back and grilled him. What do we expect when we do that to people? And there's some big questions there, you know, and there's standards. I just heard f- fight or flight, you know, it's that Absolutely. thing that you are always talking about. It, and I was thinking of him going through this and how his chakra systems must have just been like blasted. And, you know, he reacted with. Flamethrower. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a flamethrower. And this is not a surprising thing. And before we get into the specifics of both of these people, though, r- just pulling ourselves back away from the situation and noticing how much judging we're doing, mm. noticing that it's triggering us in all the places of our vulnerabilities as women. Do we go towards a woman that's going through something that is incredibly vulnerable? Do we pull away from her? Mm -hmm. What are our experiences that are inviting us into this? Do we compete with her? Was our story worse or better? Mm. Or do we deny her the right to have her experience and call her a liar and make other stories up about her? Right. And then we have the men. What do men choose about this with the with her, with Dr. Ford? Are men feeling compassionate or are they all feeling assaulted right now? Is there any man out there who doesn't feel responsible on some level for what she's talking about? I think people are terrified with what it's brought up. I mean, I mentioned this to you the other day where I had a um, elementary school friend who reached out to me and just kind of he was making light of the situation a bit, but he said, you know, 
I'm going to need you to destroy your yearbook where I wrote that inappropriate line in there. And we we were in elementary school, so it, it wasn't anything that was like super offensive to me. And yet it was something that did like get into my DNA and affect who I became as a woman. Exactly. But exactly. I, I was just really... First of all, I was caught off guard that he even reached out to me. It's not someone I talk to all the time. It was just, you know, it's been 20 years. And then I realized, wow, he he was actually having fear underneath of it. And maybe it wasn't a serious fear, but it was a slight threat of fear. And there was a slight, like, of reaching out in a soft, gentle way just to kind of say, hey, sorry about that. Not that he said he was sorry, but it was, I knew it was like a recognition of, that would have been one of those things. And his joke was, you know, do it's what everybody's saying. Do we have to be concerned about what we did 20 years ago, 40 yeah. years ago? Yeah, we do. Because it's, and I don't mean like we have to be concerned about it, but we have to be willing to say that was my consciousness at the time. Mm -hmm. That's all we have to say. And the truth is if we can find ourselves willing to just say those words, mm -hmm. oh my goodness, that was my consciousness at the time. Now, I'm not that person. I'm not that fourth grader or whatever anymore. And I'm not the fourth grader that was brought up in a culture that led me to believe that that was an appropriate thing to say to a girl, right? Yeah, because our culture back in the South, there was a lot going on that, and even things I participated in. I'm, I'm no different than these men. There are things I did and behaviors that I did that I'm completely ashamed about at this time in my life. And what you're saying is true. That was my consciousness at that time. That was the, that's how I was raised. And everybody around me was speaking a certain way and doing certain behaviors. And I'm just looking at them going, well, they're the adults in my lives. If they're doing that or saying that, I guess it's okay. And we don't even have a reference point for, I guess it's okay, really. Like we just accept it. It's our culture. It's what, mm -hmm. so what we're talking about and what I was saying, America is growing again, is our culture is growing. Our people are growing. We are Americans. I'm not a per particularly nationalistic person, but under the current administration with so much focus on America, and it feels in many cases like it's negative, I love to point out the things about it that are positive. It's like, look, we were these cutting edge lunatics that set out across the ocean when no we didn't even know. There. <laughs> no judgment. We didn't even know that there was a country out there to mm -hmm. go to, and we just kept going. Now, we did some really, really horrendous things to the Native Americans, probably to many women, to to Africans. We, we participated in horrendous things, mm -hmm. not because we chose we are horrendous people and we're choosing horrendous things, but because it was the consciousness that we were available to, was available to us at the time. This is the way our culture thought. Again, we're in this same place. Hopefully, how we feel about slavery is how we're going to feel about mistreating women and men, abusing humans. Mm -hmm. Forget whether it's just women or men, but just abusing humans. In the future, we're going to look back and go, wow, wow, I treated someone like that, and I thought it was okay? Well, all those things that you just talked about, like coming over and finding America and all the things we did, each one of those things pushed us yeah. evolutionary. Is that the right word? Evolutionarily. Evolutionarily. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they pushed us in a direction that was painful in the moment or in that time of history, yeah. but ultimately brought us closer together into our loving. It's certainly not done. We no. are in the process we of that. We have done. a long ways to go, but we are moving slowly, slowly, slowly toward loving each other more. Yeah. And you know what's interesting, Chris, is I was also focusing on like the DNA of the kind of people that would get on a boat and the DNA of the kind of people that would create a whole new country and the DNA of the people who would go out over the frontiers. I mean, the women and men had to do it together. Mm -hmm. There was no way that it was just one person doing this. It was a collaborative effort. Our constitution was a collaborative effort. It's an amazing, amazing story. I mean, when you read it, you're like, how did people come up with this document? Because we don't live it. Okay. It was a future, it was a future site that these people saw so clearly that they staked their lives on it and they almost died for it. And the question now is, are we living into that 
that all of us are created equal. We're living into it is our vision for the future. That was like the ideal scene they created. Absolutely. (laughs) It absolutely is. And so when we see that as our future, it It's because it came from who we are as a people. And so who we are as a people, the exciting thing in this moment is, wow, we're going to, we're right on the edge of that again. We're in a new frontier. Now the frontier of our country is physically, we have seen through the frontier of our country. Now we're going through the frontiers of our consciousness. Like I love what you said earlier, you were saying you know, where are we going as a country? Are we going to choose fear and divisiveness or are we going to go toward loving and connection? So here's another thought on that department. Mm -hmm. I had this thought the other day. Right now, we still see ourselves as countries around the world, around these countries with trade agreements and all this kind of stuff. What it feels like is happening is the world is going to eventually as it moves through this, come into a different kind of alignment where people who are aligned with the experience of living in the field of what we would call loving or consciousness Mm -hmm. or the greater possibility of life, those people are going to actually start to create a new world within our world. And there will be another world that will be existing simultaneously. And it's actually, of course, already happening. Right. We're not we're not saying this is in the future, but it's also happening really big time right this second. Quickly. And people are getting to choose. The distinction that's super interesting to me, and this has been very clear since um, the Trump administration, is that there are people on both sides that think they're good people. Right. And so the fact that there are sides is the tricky part. Many of us who want to like move this thing forward see the world as one playing field, see the universe as one playing field. There's no good, there's no bad. We don't, we don't vilify one person. So in this case right now, with Judge Kavanaugh on one side mm-hmm. and with Dr. Ford on the other, if we see those as two separate things— and we choose teams, we're going to have a war. Right. And we're we're on the choice point of a war right now. That's what's happening. If this vote goes one way, certain people are going to rise up. And if the vote goes the other way, other people are going to rise up. How that's going to work out, we don't know. Mm-hmm. What I do want you to know about Krista and I <laughs> is we're not particularly worried about what the rise up is because we know that the consciousness that holds all of this as good Yes. Is where we're going to go. It's all happening for us. And it might not feel... Oh, it doesn't feel good. It does not feel good in the moment, but it is serving our souls and our evolution toward love. Toward love. And we're in the shitty part right now. (laughs) And the (laughs) shitty part is so shitty. I'm even saying shitty. I just want you to know that. So... Well, and you've had some really big experiences I have with had it. Some so really big. So I don't want you guys to think we're painting this little spiritual bypass thing over here, which mm-hmm. is in we're in danger of getting close to that, I think, with our few comments we're making now. But I want to say that what's super clear to me is that our experiences drive our choices, drive our decisions about life, and then drive who we choose to be. Mm-hmm. So unfortunately, My first, I would just, we're going to just call this a trespass. I'm going to call all these things trespasses because they were varying. A few of them were quite traumatic for me. All of them were a boundary crossing beyond my ability in certain times or willingness to say yes. Mm -hmm. So some were too young to say yes to and some I was too unsure of myself to say yes to, and some were just boundary crossings when I could have said no, but I couldn't. So I take this topic very, very seriously, and I have worked on this for my entire life. Yes. My first incident was under two years old. It occurred to me, you can hear my voice starting to falter, that I should post a picture of what I looked like at the age that first incident took place to bring home the amount 
of disparity of innocence and dark and light that we can carry right. as a human being. As a human family, we own this dark and light together. How has someone be, been so incredibly maligned in their lifetime or so hurt or so mistreated that mistreating another is something that you would do to fulfill your needs? Right. So we can't get there right away. I couldn't get there right away. I had a lot of years of pain and upset over some of these things. Mm -hmm. The next incident that I didn't actually remember, oh, no, there, anyway, the one that I, next one I'm going to talk about was very big for me, and I was eight years old. And I remember absolutely everything about what happened that day until the moment I put my hand on the door, and I have nothing and to me, it didn't even happen. Wow. It didn't happen until I was 26. And the person who was the person who perpetrated this came to me and apologized. Whoa. Whoa. Wow. In a public place. Wow. By pulling me into a room, which you can imagine. How terrifying it that was, would have been. It was it's so incredibly terrifying. And his intention was good. Mm -hmm. I had no memory until that day. And he pulled me into a room, right. which was not a good idea. And he's much bigger than I am mm -hmm. and was very much at that age. So what was your takeaway, though, from that, what he had to say? I couldn't take anything at the time. I, I shut it down. I, I don't know what he's talking about. And then the memory started to come. Got it. And so in my late 20s, I dealt with a lot of the memories of what he was talking about. And it was very painful and uncomfortable. How did you feel, though, about him coming to you and apologizing? Because that's what we were just talking about, too, is this, for the masculine, just for this story, being able to come back and say, I'm so sorry, that was the consciousness of where I was at that time. So he actually did that, did. and I'm wondering what it felt like to you. Well, because it was such a shock, Mm -hmm. So in a 12-step program, you're not supposed to make amends unless it won't hurt the person you're making the amends to. Got it. That doesn't mean that he knew it was going to be a shock. Like he didn't know that you didn't he remember didn't it. He didn't know I had no memory. He didn't know it was such a huge experience for me that I would have. So let's remember, I was eight years old and he was 16. So what a 16-year, what a Older man remembers about 16, what, an, what a 24-year-old can remember about eight are very different. Right. Your brain is in a very different place. So I couldn't deal at all. I just shut it down. Like, whatever, that didn't happen. And of course, family, friends, seeing them all the time. We were at a wedding when this happened. I didn't breathe for probably two weeks. I was like, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and I also didn't have access to therapy at that point in my yeah. life. So I just shut it down, didn't happen again. And then it came up later. How I feel now about him doing that is a wow. Wow. That he could actually say that to me. Wow. And I couldn't do it at the time. Yeah. So. What about now, though? Well, I, yeah. I mean, thank you for being mm -hmm. able to do that with me. Did it allow healing around that? Well, what of course, because what it did was first of all inform me that I was carrying something I didn't know I was carrying that was so big I can't remember it. Right. And I have enough memory of it to know and I have enough memory of the other incidents that did actually start surfacing that I do know what the context was, what the room was, what the space was and what the power dynamic was. Right. As one of my friends said, oh, yeah, you were always the desired one. You were the cute one. Okay, that's called, if you ever think that it's easy to be beautiful, take a deep breath with me right now. Because this is part of the situation, is that somehow we draw this in. So if we look at this spiritually, again, we have to say, I came in with everything I came in with mm -hmm. for the reason of healing so that I can become a more loving soul, that I can carry a message to the world that is more loving than the one I came in with. Well, and that's how we know you're not 
spiritually bypassing this at this time. It's like right. you have worked on it and you are applying, and we're both applying the same belief system, the same, you know, what we think about how we study the Course in Miracles. And we were really taking our beliefs and we're applying it to this situation the exact same way as in the last couple of weeks, you know, we've applied it to our relationships and our health and all of the other things that we're going through in our lives. So the tools and the techniques and the beliefs and the remaining in our loving, we can't use those sometimes for things that are easy enough to apply them to and not use them for other this. times and for the hard things. Yeah. So we are trying to be very balanced in how we're using these tools. I don't think balance is the right word, but we are egalitarian. Not, we're using them everywhere. We're in using other words. them equally and yeah. we're not allowing our, or, and when we find ourselves not applying it in the same way to the bigger stuff, we really have to check ourselves and go, wow, we are still holding judgment that this isn't happening for our highest good. Right. And, you know, highest good is a tricky thing, right? Because mm -hmm. you think highest good to be more loving, that means everything would be loving. No, it means we're learning about compassion. One of the things we learn through a process of forgiveness is once we get to a place where we let go to a certain degree of what the quote unquote perpetrator did, we have to be able to have those feelings and to be able to own like that fucking hurt mm -hmm. or that changed my life. And we have to move through it. And we have to get to a place where I can see you and say, wow, what happened to you? And in this case, I have some history, so I do <laughs> know some of it. That you, with, in this case, I just found out, honestly, two weeks ago, I can't, it's so uncanny the way this happened. I was on a business trip and I went to see a friend I haven't seen in years. And I found out that the person that we're talking about right now mm -hmm. had been the scapegoat of the father of an alcoholic family and had been beaten mercilessly over and over in his childhood. And who knows what else he right. was subjected to. Right. I hadn't, I never heard that before. And it really drew me into another level of compassion for him. We are beings who have been hurt by each other. You both are soulmates. Exactly. Well, I guess. So, soulmates <laughs> like, are people okay. who come in to serve us. <laughs> well, I would call I, that I a I sacred just, contract. I'm like, okay, Whoa! sacred contract. Um, and, you know, it's tricky. So you can still see I have some yeah. psychological. You about fell off your chair. I when did I just said about that. fell off my chair because there's a psychological boundary that I still have that you mm -hmm. can hear. So obviously, I'm working on this still. Yeah. Like more love has to be applied more to this love. situation. Exactly. It's not pulling back and being madder at him that it's still in you. It's no, it no. has to go the other way. It has to step toward him. More love. Right. And that's what happened in this random conversation before this whole thing blew up last week. All of a sudden I was confronted with information I never had about him. Yeah. Because to me, he was a big boy. Mm -hmm. He was a big, strong, strapping 16-year-old. Mm -hmm. He wasn't the little wimpy kid that got the shit kicked out of him every day of his life. Yeah. To receive that information like changed my DNA. Yeah. It actually did. Even though I know that I'm going through and have been in a process of forgiveness with him, coming into that place of a deeper level of compassion for that child that he was, and then being able to look at it and say, it's still not excusing Right. The choice that he made. So I still had a perpetration in my body that I'm working with for the rest of my life, but mm -hmm. I don't have to make it his fault. This is what I mean about America growing. We're going to grow our children differently. We're mm -hmm. going to grow our culture differently so that we don't... This is our fault. It's our culture, and right. it's humanity's culture that has led children to treat each other this way by the way we've taught them. And it's this tricky piece where we can see it. And, and it's almost like, what do you call those things that you go like Kaleidoscope. This, kaleidoscope. <laughs> one moment there's one picture and one moment there's the other. Mm. One moment it's the victim, villain, the hero who saves the day. Mm -hmm. And then the next moment it's, oh my God, wait, look, it's beautiful. Right. Every And what's beautiful- like chaos and, to clarity. Chaos to clarity. And what's beautiful is not what happened. It's right. what you make of it. Forget lemonade. We're making heaven. 
Mm. We're making heaven out of these things. We're healing each other. We're coming back into relationship. Now, I'm not saying I've been able to approach all these people and have relationships. There have been people for whom I have never been able to be near their bodies again right. because of what happens in mine. That doesn't mean I'm not working on it. I am because I know that's my goal. I'm not there yet. One of the hardest pieces of this puzzle, because this was all buried, I never knew how where my reactivity came from. Mm to things that were happening to me, regular sexual life things that were right. happening, and how badly I would panic and freak out for people. And I need to stop and say how many incredible, loving men I've had in my life who have literally intervened in situations and said, okay, we're done here. She's going home. Or stood by me when I had to do that and somebody started bad-mouthing me and blue, oh, you're a tease, you're a blue baller, blah, blah, blah. all of that right. conversation when all I was doing was like, how did this happen? How did I get here? And I know I couldn't possibly go through with sex with you right now, but I had no insight into it. And then when I was um, 19, when I was in college, I was raped and I was a virgin Okay, I can only say I might have been a virgin because I don't actually know from that earlier incident if that is what happened. Mm -hmm. I just know something bad happened. That's all I know. But in my mind, I had never right. had sex with a man that I had chosen. Right. Let's call that virginal. That's a kind of a nice thing. <laughs> Isn't that great? You could let women be virgins until they have sex with someone they consent Jeez. to have sex mm -hmm. with. What a cool idea. Because we can't control what happens to us, but we can claim that our virginity is intact and not have it taken from us by someone right. who says, I'm taking, I'm taking your body. You don't also get to take my innocence. Mm -hmm. Wow. That really touched me. I can see that in your eyes. Yeah. Wow. I get to like I get to say. That. So when I fell in love with my college boyfriend and made love to him. That's how I lost my virginity. Nice. Awesome. How does Isn't that, that feel in your body? Oh, I, got I just chills. got chills. I hope you guys all got chills. Because it's the you get to rewrite your story. Yes. Your memories. And and I get to claim that that was my choice of my virginity, and you can't take it from me. No matter what you do, you cannot take my virginity from me. You can take my body. Right. Whew. And that is such an, a remarkable thing. I We're having a healing. <laughs> we're right in front of you having a healing, healing. Spontaneous. This is what happens when we grab these. It's a kaleidoscope. It it's is. like the it's like, chaos is just there. And all of a sudden it was like, Aah. beautiful. Yeah. This is what happens when we examine from a kindness, from, you know, we have to out ourselves. We did a prayer before we started. Because when we're in a jangly place in the kaleidoscope, we're not prepared to be the teachers, the leaders, the lovers, the mm -hmm. kindness that we want. So we pray. That's We affect our experience so that we show up as who we want to be. We don't let ourselves run out in the world with what our adrenaline might t tell us is the way to react to a situation. Yeah, because the truth is we're both like, oh, this is a big topic. I don't oh. know if we're prepared oh. to do it or, you know, there's just a lot of territory that we could get into that would be uncomfortable. And we were just like, okay, well, we're doing it anyways. And in our little conversation before we started, you were, t you know, telling me some of your experiences, which I kind of knew. And my response to you is, oh, I haven't had any of those. I've just had these little things that have happened all along the way. And you jumped on you. Yes, you did. In a very gentle way. I jumped with love. Yeah, because I haven't had any huge... And, and I said that to you because I didn't want to do this episode from the place of, oh, that I completely understand what you've gone through. Because mm -hmm. I don't, because that hasn't been my experience. But my experience has been about words, the things that have been said to me. And yes, the things like the boys when I was in elementary school running up and grabbing my butt in the classroom or, or the fun games I was telling you about when we were playing in the pool and, um, you know, and we some were of those grabbing are and grabbing. Some of those are consensual. And a lot of them were. And a lot Absolutely. of them started happening 
not consensual, but became consensual out of like, well, that's the way it is. That's the way the world is. So oh, that's the way I get intention. That's the way I get love. That's exactly. The way. And so then little beliefs get seeded in my head of who I am. And then, then something maybe a little bigger happens. And then I go, well, that's just the way it is. I mean, there have been every, I, this is hard, but you know, every time I even go back to my hometown, it's like the dialogue that happens there mm. is so upsetting to me. That whenever I come back to California, it literally takes me a couple of months to get all of that out of my system because things are said there not out of malintent. No one's saying it to be a bad person. But what they're saying is so shocking to hear because I just go, God, I can't believe people still say that and don't know that it's not okay to say that. And I, just... You know, every time I come back, I'm like de having to deprogram myself. It's true. So we got to watch, you know, we got to watch who our people are. We have to watch that people who are with us care that we choose loving. If we, if we don't choose people like that, they do, the, the conversation begins to affect our consciousness. We can't help it. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, Chris and I are doing this podcast, not because we like found a person in the world and we we're like, hey, let's do a podcast, because our conversation started getting so aligned and so deep together that we knew that we were the people that we wanted to be together and that the time we spent together was actually useful and and evolutionary for like us. Like every time we had a conversation, one of our one of us was having a big epiphany, a big aha, a big healing moment, and it felt loving and it felt good. So of course you want to be around people where it where it feels that good. Yeah. And so that's what, I think what you're saying is yeah. like start choosing those people where you're in alignment and choose people who are moving toward loving. Anybody who's spitting out hateful thoughts and hateful words, even if they think they have reason to. It's like, apply love to them, oh, though they must be really hurting that that's how they're thinking right now, and just continue sending them love. I love you. I may not agree with your reaction or your behavior right now, but that doesn't mean I don't love you as a soul having a human experience. Exactly. And you can really see that kind and compassionate people are on both sides of this conversation right now. Yes. And hateful angry speech is coming in this conversation also. On both sides. On both sides. Yes. That's what I'm saying. So what I'm saying is that the people that you might want to consider choosing, don't look at what side of the conversation they're on. Look at how they're handling their way of being. The conversation. Yeah. The, so we talk about being sourced a lot. Mm -hmm. Where are we sourced? So where you're sourced means what consciousness are you coming from that chooses basically your words and your behavior for you? Mm -hmm. So Krista and I, after our deep education and concentration and self-education, have chosen that we come from a culture and a consciousness of loving. We believe in the power of love. We believe in the power of compassion, of kindness, that when people work together, things work. When people work against, things don't work. What we're wanting to invite everyone into is it's okay for you to see this from a way like maybe you have as as a person had a situation where someone told a lie about you and it just like brush fire. Mm -hmm. And so you have a place inside you that is so compassionate to what's happening to Judge Kavanaugh that you can't even hear that there's someone else suffering here. Or you have had so many incredibly painful physical tra trespasses in your life as a woman or a man that you can't hear him. Right. So there's, there's no way that we're going to resolve this by choosing sides. Mm -mm. We have to choose compassion. We choose loving. And it's hard as fuck. <laughs> Okay, hard as fuck. To it's the only time compassion. we don't want it to be hard as fuck. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's not, it, yeah, that's a, <laughs> that just made you lose your mind. I did. It just made me lose my mind. I, I want to say there are so many levels of what mm -hmm. happens in a trespass, partly because it's violent, frequently. Right. It's always a trespass if you don't say yes. But the level of violence 
In the case of Dr. Ford, the fact that she thought she might die is actually probably the worst thing about this and why it is so seared into her memory. Mm-hmm. There are probably times when I, I should not say probably, there are times that I'm not going to single out when I had to sort of fight someone off a little bit harder than I wanted to. Mm-hmm. I had to kind of push them away or whatever. That was not my preference, but it was not violent. And when I compare that to the times that were violent and what has transpired in terms of my physical body's need to release those things, it's completely different. But again, this goes back to you having the real physical experiences and me having kind of the the lower level word. So and what you're saying, it's like even you just right then were distinguishing of like, oh, it wasn't, I didn't have to push them off to save my life. You were pushing them off to... I don't know if that's making so any sense, me, yeah. but like, why well, why do we have to qualify it that way? It's like we shouldn't have to push off at all, right? Well, the only reason I was qualifying, just to be clear, because I appreciate mm-hmm. your question, is the level of violence has to do with the level of trauma, right? So when we're coming back through the experience, there may be ways in which you have to challenge yourself mentally and emotionally about some of those experiences and let them go. Mm-hmm. When it's a physically violent experience that creates a trauma like that, number one, you lose the memory in some cases, Mm -hmm. and number two, or the memory is seared. It's sort of hard to see which way it's going to go. So flash forward another five years, and I was um, jumped on the street in Boston, and I was knocked between two parked cars, and there was no way I was getting out. And as I went to the ground, I knew this person's intent was to rape me. And I, I, as I fell to the ground, literally the words, no fucking way, went through my head. I don't know what came over me. I don't know if it was like, okay, we have reached the top <laughs> of my ability in this lifetime to have this happen. Yes. I don't know what happened. But for the first time in my entire life of more instances of this than we want to even imagine, I started screaming. My fifth chakra came alive. I just started. So the police got 10 reports that (sighs) someone was being murdered on the streets in Boston. I was in the nicest neighborhood in Boston. It is lighted with gas lights. Mm. It is so precious that you can die there because there's no safety, really. Mm. But that's not true. So as I'm falling, I'm thinking, I'm between two parked cars. No one's ever going to find me. It's pitch dark out here. I start screaming, and I hear the angel voices of a bunch of young guys my age. They're, start, they're yelling back, and they're screaming, tell us where you are. Tell us where you are. And I'm, I have no idea. So I'm just screaming. They're like, keep screaming. And I can hear. It was one of those weird East Coast mm. nights when there's so much density that you can hear the footfall like clop. Clomp, clomp. I can hear them starting to run. And they're just running. It. There's six of them, it turned out. And they're running in every direction. And they're like, where are you? And they just keep running. And they're saying, they just keep yelling, keep screaming, keep screaming. And it was like the heavens opened up. These angels were just all around me. And then, of course, all these lights start going on. It was pitch dark. All these lights start going on. People start coming out on the street. And the person who I guess, I don't know what we would call him, the perpetrator at this moment, gets up and starts running, and he runs smack into my angels. Smack into them. So they caught him? They caught him. They sat on him. They just sat on him until the cops got there. That's so intense. It's so intense. It was so intense. Was that the last experience that happened to you? Um... Well, I have one unfortunate follow-up to this, and I'm, no, but yeah. most, the biggest that has happened to me, the rest of them are about me learning how to take care of myself. Mm-hmm. But this Dang, one, that would have been a really good um, ending. ending if, yeah. the, if the angels would have opened. and Well, here there was more say, learning for me. Yeah. And the learning from this one was in a funny place. It was in the courtroom. Hmm. Because I had to go face him in a courtroom. Because we caught him. So I was glad, mm-hmm. but I was sad. Yeah. 
And I was alone, and I didn't tell anyone. I was going to court. I was there by myself. And he got convicted of something with the intent to rape was the right. conviction. And then he appealed. And he was um, acquitted on the appeal. And my, I, was, I had changed cities. I was too traumatized. My company did not want me in that city anymore. And they moved me back to safe New York City, <laughs> where I was safer. And um, they, my lawyer called me and he said, this is a red letter day for me. I probably will never practice law again. Hmm. He said, I must do something else. There's something wrong with the system. It's broken. Wow. And it was, it was, I had to leave work, as you can imagine. <laughs> um, but the good news, I felt like the good news was that I had moved. So I was safe. If I had still been in Boston, I would have had to worry for my safety again. And I didn't. I did worry for everyone else's safety yeah. in Boston, but I couldn't take care of that. And there was a higher level of trauma in me once he was acquitted. And mm -hmm. I just mean that it was like he was in the world with me again. He right. wasn't in jail. And that was frightening. And it gave me another avenue to keep working through this, to keep finding a way to understand what would have how would that have happened that someone would go there? Right. You know, and Because, again, he probably had a story similar to— He did. He had a story. story. Yeah. And one of parts of his story was I was an upper-class white girl, and fuck me. He was mm. going to take what I had. I looked so easily, had everything, right? Mm. And he was going to take it. That was actually part of his Defense. defense. I had to hear him say those words in front of me in the courtroom. And I knew how true, how not true it was that I had everything, but I know how much I look like that person who's never had a care in her life. Yeah. Again, and you have a story that they don't know about because look exactly. at all the trauma you had experienced. Exactly. It's so, so it, it's like we treat each other as if what we see is what we are mm. and that we have a right to judge and... It must have been the perfect thing. It really must have been for whatever happened that day. My lawyer was not meant to be a lawyer. Maybe he has become the most freaking advocate of advocate of God knows what right. in the world because we don't know each other. He right. was a public defender. Right. He'll never see me again. I'll never see him again. But his life was changed, mm -hmm. and he had to work through his own levels of upset and fear and anger and hurt about the system. Just and like we I, can, oh, I can only hope that the perpetrator was able to find help and that his path was shifted in the future after that. I'm just sending light ahead that absolutely. he went on to do better things than that behavior. You know, he needed a second chance. That's what the universe was like. No, we're not going to take this guy out here. And this is not up to us. This is the hard part, mm -hmm. is that we want to know, we want to take the thing and say, what's right here is that Kavanaugh should be in the Supreme Court. What's right here is he shouldn't be in the Supreme Court. We have no control over that. All we have a control over is who we are being. And I became a much kinder, much more loving person after I processed all these experiences, mm -hmm. even to men, because I had to learn what was there for them, mm -hmm. that they would make a choice, those specific men and then men in general, right. to hurt someone. And then I had to go, oh, yeah, and, and I've hurt people in my life. I don't do it that way. That way, but we do it in other ways. Which, and this is where, in the, from the world of spirituality, it doesn't matter how you are perpetrating other people. If you're perpetrating them, whether you're lying to them or raping them, you are perpetrating. You are treating them as an inhuman. Yes. You are carrying out an inhuman act against someone that is in any space not okay. Mm -hmm. 
And we can see, we go, so we go back and we do our own self-forgiveness because if we don't forgive ourselves, there is no way in hell, which I mean hell, that we're going to ever forgive anyone else. Right. We go back, I get to look at the people that I was mean to in my life, the kids I teased. Can you be more specific in what it looks like to do self-forgiveness around yeah. this topic? Well, I, there, I'm of two minds about self-forgiveness. It's mm -hmm. interesting because the first stage of self-forgiveness is a real statement to myself that I am letting go. So I forgive myself. But I'm not let I'm letting go of the judgments and the harshness and the separation against myself. I'm not letting go of the action. The action I may have to learn from. Right. But I'm letting go of how mean I've been to myself about the action. So can you ground so that with a specific example? A, a specific example is I forgive myself for judging myself as heartless in the way I treated one of my college roommates. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sucks to say mm -hmm. out loud. And the truth is? And the truth is that I was doing my best in the moment of that, that my thinking was aligned with that behavior, and that now I see my thinking was off. And that I can have compassion for where I was coming from in that place and the anger and hurt that I was carrying. Mm -hmm. And trauma. And trauma. That I would take that out on another human being. And what so, I hear in that is then the ability to, that's why we can eventually, eventually forgive our perpetrators. Absolutely. Because we start seeing the projection of how we too have done those things to other people. And again, That's we're not it. talking about the levels of it. We're just talking about we have done that in some form. Right. And the, the thing is that there, the Course in Miracles says there are no levels in miracles. Mm -hmm. All miracles are just miracles. And we'll go with Einstein on this because we're going with <laughs> everything's a miracle, not nothing's a miracle. Right. But if there are no levels of a miracle, then there are no levels of a perpetration either. Once well, you've crossed that boundary against someone else, you've crossed the boundary against someone else. Right. And whether you're, I mean, yes, there are people who need to be sequestered from society because they can't stop themselves. That is means they have an issue. But with what normal people in normal circumstances are under, once we know whether that person is safe to be in society again, it is time to let it go and give that person a second chance. And I feel like I should say that, and I can say that, and I have said that. And if I can say that, other people can say that. And Forgiveness is a miracle. It's a miracle. And what also is a miracle is once you get through the self-forgiveness, you begin to understand that what our brains tell us is happening produces, again, our action. Mm -hmm. So this man is walking down the street, and he tells himself that I have everything. And it won't hurt me for him to take it from me. Or it will hurt me, but I deserve it. Something in his brain justified the hurting of another human before he could do it. Mm -hmm. He couldn't have done it otherwise. Because who we are naturally would never hurt anyone. The Ten Commandments are rules for people who have lost their way. Nobody needs to be told not to kill somebody. That's ridiculous. We are only need to be in our hearts about it, and we know that we're not even going to want to lie to somebody. Right. So forgiveness goes through levels where you find yourself in a place where you let go of yourself, you let go of them and the action. Then you start to look and you go, oh, actually, there's not really a need for forgiveness here. Because what they were doing made perfect sense based on how they were brought up, what their DNA is. Now, and we don't want you, them to— And what you needed— And what I needed to add that other piece until what I needed in terms of my growth. spiritual growth. And so at this point, do you have any forgiveness available for him in that situation? Well, what, what I really am saying, Chris, is that the forgiveness evaporates. Mm -hmm. Like, the need for forgiveness evaporates. So it's almost like, yeah, I— I have had forgiveness for him, but now this feels better. Right. 
This is like, I respect who you were in that moment and that you were coming from a place that I will never understand. But that's why you're not judging him for doing something wrong. Exactly. You're judging the misbelief that he did something wrong, or you're forgiving yourself for judging him in certain ways. But you're not saying what he did was wrong because you are applying the spiritual premise that there is no right or wrong. It's all serving you for your soul's highest good. And it's super tricky. Super tricky. 20 years ago, and it gets a little less each year as you step closer and closer into your loving and your soul perspective. Exactly. And this would take us back to the conversation about chakras that we had earlier in one of our shows, um, which is that you take everything that happens to you through the seven, eight levels of chakras that we have available to us, and seven of them are in our bodies. So the first level is my physical relationship with this earth, and I make sure I'm safe. Mm -hmm. So he gets arrested. We do our best to keep him off the streets, and then we make sure. Second level is I care for other people. I work back into relationship with him. There are foundations set up, beautiful books written by people who have forgiven the people who have killed their children. Right. I cannot. That one, for me, I'm still wondering about. Please don't give me don't the put opportunity that, don't to find that out. Take that back. Reel it back. Yeah. I don't, I don't want that opportunity, but I am impressed. Mm-hmm. Azim Hamisa has a foundation. His son was killed by um, a gang member when he was delivering pizzas as a teenager, and he's taken his whole life and created a foundation by that name. And that might be his son's name, but I'm not sure, um, that you can find even on LinkedIn. I mean, it's really a thing. Mm -hmm. And there are people who have done this. This is the spiritual message that we're talking about. This is the kind of warrior that we are becoming. We are warriors for love. We are warriors for truth. We know that when you hold people to the highest level of who they are, that they can actually reach back through whatever the fog is, whatever the lessons are, and come back home. If we hold them to who they acted like once, they may never be able to come home. It's Because then we're also just, we're hammering home to them that we never believe they can change and that they are that behavior. They are the behavior rather than... And then we we, know. Then we're buying into it, which is further creating it. And we were suggesting going the opposite way and reminding people the truth of who they are. The truth, like if someone every day said to that man, the truth is you are a loving being. The truth is you're a loving being. The truth is you're a loving being. Every day, there might come a day where he can start believing it about himself. Yeah. And we, instead and of every day going, putting him in jail and every day he's a piece of shit, you're a piece of shit, you're a piece of shit, that just keeps that pattern of his going. Yeah, and you know we're not going to go talk about the prison system right now no, because it's not, just but. too big, but it is this conversation. Yeah. So all we're trying to put out into the world is that we're not being naive about this. No. This is samurai training. This yes. is spiritual warrior training. That when you are never, I've been told by, my, by a bunch of people who have taught me in my life <laughs> that you are never given anything you can't handle. And some of us are given all sorts of different things. And what I got given was this experience repeatedly that I was not only given but inviting somehow that my consciousness is getting the chance. And I'm saying getting because I'm still growing. Right. I still cry when I hear stories. Mm -hmm. And you still deal with with the fallout in current relationships. And you can still see the threads of how it's all impacted. I do. I still have crossover visualizations and things like that that happen Mm -hmm. to me. I'm I'm someone who my partner actually has to make space for that. Yeah. And that's what's true. And then it gives that person a choice to be against or for also. So... We're putting this pretty big podcast on your doorstep, inviting you to really consider, is whatever you're holding against someone really worth your life? Because that's what you are basically giving Mm. to it. Thank you for discussing this. I really mm. appreciate your honesty and openness (sighs) and bravery. Uh, Like I said, I can't imagine, but I love you. Thank you. And you're giving a huge gift every time you speak about it, and you speak about it in this way of being. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that 
people ask us all the time is like, oh, well, how can you have a podcast like this if your life isn't perfect? And it's like, that's the point. It's that no one's life is perfect, but it's how are we going to be with ourselves as we're going through it? And we are choosing to the best of our ability as quickly as we can come back into it. We are choosing to be in our loving. And it doesn't mean we don't fly out of our loving. It's just the constant practice of bringing ourselves back to it. And some days we can do it in 30 seconds and some days it takes us a month, but it's still our constant goal to bring it back to love. And so we just offer that to all of you listening of, you know, finding one small way today that you can bring yourself back into your loving over a situation. And maybe that is with yourself. Yeah. Just start there. Just put your hands on your heart and or hug yourself and just say, it's going to be okay. It, it's already okay. All is well. Yeah. We love you and appreciate you listening so much. You have absolutely no idea what it means to us to hold you in our space and to have you comment and talk to us and come visit us. Please keep coming. And sending us your emails. We so appreciate them. We love yes, you. Yes. We spread love the you. love. Spread, spread the, the love. love. Spread the love. All right. Bye. Bye.